Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this month's AFP uh, educational program. We are so thrilled to be here at the Blair Singer Academy to have this wonderful opportunity to talk about the art of persuasion. It's going to be a great program today. I want to first of all thank our sponsor for today, Martz and Lundy and Willard White. Thank you. You're welcome for that and I appreciate the introduction, of course. The, and I have a few things to say. Chris, I'm, certain, I'm glad you mentioned Giving USA and the annual update on philanthropy in America, which is a much anticipated, much analyzed set of data about where philanthropy is coming from and what the trends are and the shifts in the business. And for us, opportunities and challenges to work with prospects and donors. You know that the numbers for philanthropy, go back to the Great Recession. It's the first time in our history back in 07, 08, when we actually saw a dip in philanthropy. Many of us, and I have been in this business for decades, many of us believe that philanthropy was immune to economic forces and change. It turns out we're wrong on that point at that time because philanthropy at the high levels halted in 09 and 10. It was March of 2010 before we saw multi-million dollar pledges occur again. We had about a 14 month drought. And for that to happen in the United States with the extraordinary wealth that is accumulated in private homes was shocking. And it was almost like the banking crisis and everything else. Many of us were looking at the crisis in philanthropy. But since March 2010, the upswing, the trend in philanthropy has been so positive, we like to think it will continue forever. We do not have the figures yet from Giving USA. They come out soon, and Martin Lundy is part of that team that works on the numbers. But anticipate it's going to be over $400 billion. Now, who's going to tell me where the majority of those gifts come from? They come from Individual, I didn't hear you. Individuals. They have always been, in this country, the largest, greatest source of philanthropy. And that is um, for several reasons. Individuals give. It's individuals and families that give. And there are many ways of giving. Direct gifts. There are family foundations. But there's something else happening that we need to take a look at. Donor-advised funds. Are any of you working directly with donors who give through DAFs? The phenomenal growth in DAFs will probably, it's actually already exceeded the total assets of independent foundations. That happened two years ago. We predict that will be over 100 billion in DAFs. What's interesting to me is that many looked at this financial instrument and said, you know, because it's less regulated than family foundations, it's never quite going to perform and impact our organizations, the charitable organizations. It turns out that in the last two years, DAFs are actually distributing 20% of assets, 20% of assets. Do you, you know what the minimum is for a family foundation? It's 5%. We are looking at the greatest opportunity for giving, and it is, in, it is individual giving because donor-advised funds are like family foundations. They are actually managed, influenced, directed by living donors and their heirs. So keep this in mind. When... Um, there's something on the table here from Martz and Lundy. We work with uh, the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, Indiana University, on doing a, you know, a, ph a philanthropy or a philanthropic outlook every year. 
and we do it in two year, you know, tranches. The one that was done for 2017 and 2018, and these are all available online. We do this for the good of the profession. We've been very optimistic. Always philanthropy is outpacing gross domestic product, and there are a number of complicated reasons for it that you don't have to read, actually. Just know that philanthropy is alive and well and doing very well. But something happened last fall. You remember the um, 2017, the Tax and Tax Recovery and Jobs Act passed. And are any of you aware or received messages about the kind of negative impact this would have on philanthropy? That was a general reaction in our profession. So Martin Lundy and the Lay School, for reasons that personally I didn't quite agree with, but skip that, published a, a reduction in our forecast, still outpacing all forecasts for economic growth in the US. I am more optimistic about philanthropy, particularly from individual giving, and that is primarily our subject today, the, uh, the um, goals of this workshop. But the reasons for it have to be the donor advised funds and family foundations that already are set up as a massive endowment for future giving gifts and grants to our organizations. There's also a report over here on mega gifts just out from, from Martin Lundy. And this is, we have such large gifts happening across all sectors. 75% of $10 million plus gifts go to higher education. Now we have two attendees today from universities. ASU is represented, AT Still University is represented. The rest of us are in sectors of arts, culture, environment, social service, and human uh, and public, and public uh, benefit activities. So do not be distracted by all the attention given to growth in the total pool of philanthropy and don't grieve that you are not lined up for gifts of 10 million to 100 million this year. May it come soon. Most of us are working in ranges of giving from 5,000 to $500,000. And those are transformational gifts for our organizations. But it's interesting that big gifts attract attention, they get a lot of press, they have huge impact on the institutions. But unless you are in the favored zip codes of wealth and have historic access to some of those high net worth families, pay attention to the realistic market for your organization. We are actually hosted by Blair Singer Academy for a reason. As the pool of dollars increases for philanthropy, some of you may have noticed that the number of 501c3 organizations competing for those dollars is going up much faster than the available pool of philanthropy. And that is something not to, you know, to frighten us, but it does say something about the competition for dollars nationwide it says something about the pressures that I see placed on frontline fundraisers at this time, in this decade particularly. What we are looking for are more skills, more tools in the toolbox in order to compete successfully, to stay ahead of the competition. It's as literal as that. And I believe that the you know, that the practices and the wisdom and the models that come from the for-profit world are very much needed in our profession. Now, Blair Singer is established as a leading feature, a force in um, 
leadership training, it's personal and professional development, and salesmanship. And I think we're all going to be pleased by the time we spend here in your care today. He is the founder of the Blair Singer organization, of course. He's also the author of several best-selling books that include uh, Sales Dogs and uh, Little little Voice Mastery. Um, and you, somehow you have worked with hundreds of thousands of individuals, and I mean people like us, and helped them become leaders and facilitators and salespeople, super salespeople. We're also working in partnership with Blair. Khalid Jordi is here, and many of you have met both Blair and Khalid already. And Khalid is a trainer with Blair Singer. He's also a trainer with the Sandler Organization. He is the founder of Fearless Transformation, his own proprietary program of leadership and training, team building, and uh, personal professional development, which is offered to individuals and corporations and some government agencies. Many of you know that Holland and I together founded a charity called Walid's Fund that works with Syrian refugees in southern Lebanon. And in that organization, Holland is our director of operations. I imagine that at the end of today, all of you will go back to your, your list, your priority list of actions, and with your usual wisdom and grace, you will add to your day probably a few sharper tools in your fundraising toolbox, thanks to the art of persuasion. I welcome Blair and Hollett. So let me ask a question before we begin. How many of you in this room would like the remainder of 2018 to be one of your best fundraising years so far? Show of hands. Okay, good. How many would agree that last year at the minimum was interesting? <laughs> okay, good. So the reason I ask those two questions is because the goal for Cal and myself is to make sure that out of the very short time that we're together is to give you some tools, some techniques, some ideas that will be able to help, will allow you to generate a little bit more this time and to attack and to be able to go after a market, as Willard was saying, a, a market of individuals who really are already looking for you. They just don't know it yet. How many people would like to find that market? Okay, good, thanks. So, um, so first of all, Willard, thank you for for setting this whole thing up. Uh, thank you, AFP, for for allowing us to be part of this. Uh, it's quite an honor, quite an honor. I um, I was up late last night, quite honestly, and I I, as Willard said, over the last twenty, let's just say twenty five plus years. I've worked with hundreds of thousands of people in over 30 countries around the world. I mean, every year I'm in at least 25 countries working with organizations and individuals and entrepreneurs, helping them build championship teams, whoops, increase, thank you, increase sales, and how to become great facilitators and leaders. But last night, I was pretty nervous. And the reason I was nervous, and that's not usual for me with doing these because I've, I've, I've done lots of presentations because what you do is so critically important. Honest. If you don't do what you do, other people whose voices might never be heard will never be heard. Everybody understand, yes? So I know that the people that are in here, you're here. I don't know that anybody's here to make a personal fortune doing what you're doing, okay? Sometimes I talk to people, and that's what they're in here. They're in, how much money can I make, right? Entrepreneurs, that's what they do. But in this room, what I know without meeting you is that you have other motivation. And the other motivation is to, help, is to pay forward for a lot of people that don't have voices. So it's an honor for myself and for Cal to be with you guys and do whatever we can 
to make your trip, your journey, not only more lucrative for fundraising, but also more rewarding for you. Deal? So please give yourselves a round of applause for being here. Okay? Um, you know, Willard mentioned, I mentioned, I, I, I do, I work with many or, large organizations like Singapore Airlines, Morgan Stanley, IBM, L'Oreal, Brands, people like that, and also thousands, interestingly, thousands of entrepreneurs, small business owners, medium-sized business owners, but very similar to the marketplace that Willard was referring to, individuals in that 5,000 to half a million dollar range. I know. I know they give. I'm one of them. Everybody understand? Yes, I sit on the board, actually, of a local uh, 501c3, um, maybe some of you know, K2 Adventure Foundation, um, that we raise money uh, for children, kids with disabilities here in Arizona, and we do a tremendous amount of work internationally every summer for the last six years. I think we've raised in kind and in cash a little over $6 million to support orphanages in Tanzania. Bring up the other person who's going to, I want to introduce you as well. also be leading you through today. Um, Cal, I met how many years ago? Three, four years ago? Yeah, somewhere around four. Four years ago. Um, what you don't, what you may or may not know, I mean, Willard gave him a great introduction. Uh, I will tell you this, the, one of the other things when he does, when he's not in here, he's a fighter. Every once in a while, I come across a person that just will not give up. How many know what I'm talking about? Maybe some of you are like that. A person that once they get a thought in their mind, once they have a driven by a mission, they just never give up, and he's one of them. Um, and uh, he's been studying with me, studying with Sandler, great salesperson, great teacher. Uh, give it up for Cal. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Blair. Thank you all for being here today. How many of you are already getting something out of this conversation this morning? Great. How many of you are looking forward to get some more? Great, thank you. The only reason why with a donor, in my opinion, that they want to give to you is because you're able to understand their deep desire, their compelling reason why they want to give and be able to relate it to your mission. Instead of me starting telling them about my nonprofit and our mission, what would you like to know? You expressed some interest. What, would you, what got you to express interest? What got you to sit with me here today? Who, who, was, who was pitching to who? In all honesty, you, you completely flipped the, the script on me. I kind of forgot which one I was. Was that a good thing? Yeah. <laughs> all right, very good. Yeah. Very good. So it has to be a conversation. Did it seem like a conversation here? Yes? It wasn't pitching. I was just having conversation. And that's how trust is built. Does that make sense? Yeah? Just asking more questions. Okay, very good. So, noticed. I started with a problem, a surface problem, and then I ended up with a compelling emotional reason. And what is his com uh, emotional compelling reason is? What's the, what's the emotional word he, say, he used? Sad. And when he's sad, when he's vulnerable, I bring a blanket, I put him around him, I nurture him, empathize, I understand. That's what our mission is. We're with you. We want to relate there. So once I get there, the compelling reasons, now I can ask him, would you like me now to tell you more about our mission? I ask another permission to move on to the next step. I didn't start throwing Okay, well, if you give me $5,000, <laughs> now you'll be able to help, you know, three kids, right? No, because if a donor really understands your mission and they really trust you and they're interconnected with what you're saying and you're asking the right questions and they understand that you understand what their compelling reasons are, then all you got to do is just, what would you like to do next? Help me understand what... What got you to be curious about our mission? Because we help homeless people. We don't work with animals. Is that something you still want to talk about, or is it over? Do you see that? 
you don't want to waste their time and you sure don't want to waste your time because you could be helping other animals or other people if you are in front of the right donor and if you are addressing their concerns. Fair? Your job is to disqualify as many donors as possible so you can get to the right donor and get bigger gifts. <laughs> you seem very excited. Can you, can you just tell us what's going on just right here? Well, I think that creates freedom for us. And um, it takes pressure off because it's not about us. And we don't have to worry about it. And it's not about, oh, I lost him. No, he made a decision to go somewhere else and, and give his money to something that is really meaningful to him. And that's good because it frees up our time to do other th things with people who want to be engaged. Okay. I want to thank Blair and Cal and your team for taking us as fundraisers to a new place. Um, and if I could say, I, I've written down about 10 things that really impressed me about today, but I'll, I'll only say one. And that is, um, I think what you helped me see was I, um, all of the presumptions and assumptions, and I used that phrase before, that we take into our, that we have in our jobs and we take into our meetings with our donors. You gave us permission to be bold, to be clear um, about asking what they want and about, here's the really big part, stating what we want on behalf of our organizations. And that is a huge, huge step. And I'm excited to see what happens with all of us in that. Um, the other thing, when someone else at my table um, or someone else said, you're helping us get out of our own way. In, in raising money for the things we care about. Please thank Blair and Cal and Willard for making today possible as he draws the winning ticket. Give them a big hug, tell them they're amazing.